Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we're going over the Come Follow Me lesson for May 17th through 23rd, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants, sections 51 to 57. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Oh, this is going to be great. Boy, there's a lot of you today. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 30 minutes, 34 seconds. Hey, that sounds like the longest one we've had so far this year. It is. It is. But you can do it if you break it up daily. It's 4 minutes, 22 seconds. Fantastic. Not so bad. Excellent. And you can do it even easier if you decide to break it up by section. To do that, you can use the time codes here and study with us section by section. But we do have a reminder that there are links in the description below the video if you're watching on YouTube. There are links that have to do with the show, but there's also a PDF that you can download of all the slides and quotes that we're going to show today. So if you're interested in that, feel free to check that out. If you're looking at YouTube on a web browser, you might have to click Read More in order to see the links for the PDF. And also as another reminder, the show has two different formats. If you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing the video format. But there's also an audio-only format that is available wherever you get audio podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, etc. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that both versions are out there. Fantastic. We've got a lot to cover today, and so let's jump right in with section 51. Now, it's important with any of these sections that we understand the background. So we're going to take time with each one of these to talk about what was happening that led to the revelation. This introduction is coming from the Student Institute Manual. It says, In late December 1830 and early January 1831, the Prophet Joseph Smith received revelations from the Lord instructing the saints to gather in Ohio. The Colesville branch, consisting of more than 60 church members, was one of three groups of saints to leave New York to gather in Ohio. They departed from Colesville, New York in mid-April 1831 with Newell Knight as their leader. After a month-long journey that included delays due to inclement weather, they arrived in Ohio about mid-May. According to Newell Knight, when they arrived, it was advised that the Colesville branch remain together and go to a neighboring town called Thompson. As a man by the name of Lehman Copley owned a considerable tract of land there, which he offered to let the brethren occupy. Bishop Edward Partridge sought instruction on how to provide for the newly arrived saints, so Joseph Smith inquired of the Lord. In response, on May 20th, 1831, the prophet received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 51. Now, you remember Lehman Copley from our last lesson. He was the former shaker. The considerable tract of land that they're talking about was 759 acres. Ooh, that, that is, is con- huge. That's considerable. So let's take a look at the section, starting in verse 4. And let my servant Edward Partridge, when he shall appoint a man his portion, give unto him a writing that shall secure unto him his portion, that he shall hold it, even this right and this inheritance in the church, until he transgresses and is not accounted worthy by the voice of the church according to the laws and covenants of the church to belong to the church. But something interesting here, so Edward Partridge is going to give each person a portion of this land and given an inheritance and there shall be a writing to secure him his portion. In other words, he will legally own it. In verse 5, if someone does transgress and leaves the church, They can't reclaim anything that they've donated to the church, but they still have a claim over their appointed stewardship. It is, in fact, an ownership. This is the big difference between the United Order and other communal living or socially centralized programs. To explain this further, there's a clip from the Student Institute Manual that says, quote, The process of consecrating property was to be done according to the principle of agency 
as was explained in a June 1833 letter to Bishop Partridge and signed by Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Frederick G. Williams, and Martin Harris. Every man must be his own judge of how much he should receive and how much he should suffer to remain in the hands of the bishop. The matter of consecration must be done by mutual consent of both parties, for to give the bishop power to say how much every man shall have and each man be obliged to comply with the bishop's judgment is giving the bishop more power than a king has. And upon the other hand, to let every man say how much he needs and the bishop be obliged to comply with his judgment is to throw Zion into confusion and make a slave of the bishop. The fact is, there must be a balance or equilibrium of power between the bishop and the people, and thus harmony and goodwill may be preserved among you. Therefore, those persons consecrating property to the bishop in Zion and then receiving an inheritance back must show reasonably to the bishop that he needs as much as he claims. End quote. That just makes sense. Yep. And it's so great to be able to have a conversation about that because... Maybe I feel like I need this, but then when I talk it through and work it out and think of it with maybe a little bit more of an eternal perspective, maybe not so much. I think it's a great self-evaluation, too. Well, and I wonder if there weren't situations in which someone had initially said, well, look, I need this, and then maybe months later or maybe even a year later realized, well, I guess I really don't. Well, so what do you do in that situation? Ah, You consecrate that back to the bishop and the bishop resigns. Yeah, that's a great system. Let's take a look here in verse 9. It says, And let every man deal honestly and be alike among this people and receive alike that ye may be one, even as I have commanded you. Remember that that is the underlying purpose for all of this, unification. Do you remember in Doctrine and Covenants section 38, if ye are not one, ye are not mine. Yeah. So we need to be honest with ourselves and with others about what our needs are and what our resources are. In verses 10 through 20, the Lord instructed Bishop Partridge to establish a storehouse where surplus goods could be kept. He explained that he had consecrated the land to the saints for a little season, as he says in verse 16. Although they did not know how long they would stay there, they were to act upon this land as for years, in verse 17, being faithful, wise, and just stewards of what they had been given. Now, jumping back to verse 10, the word church used there refers to a branch of the church, and you can see that in footnote A. There's also references to the church being used in that way in Doctrine and Covenants 20, verse 81, and 4564. Now, the bishop at this time, and this is an interesting bit of trivia, this was a full-time job. Think of it rather than as we think of bishops today, think of the bishop as someone the church would use, say, to manage the resources of the fast offering funds from the church office building. It's somebody who's employed full-time to manage this. So notice the reference in verse 14 to a portion to reserve to himself. If he didn't do that, Edward Partridge would not be able to provide for himself and his family. So that's an important piece that built into that is the means whereby the bishop can take care of he and his family as he's doing this full time. Now, in verse 19, there's a great promise. And whoso is found a faithful, a just, and a wise steward shall enter into the joy of his Lord and shall inherit eternal life. I think that's really important because we are given stewardship over things today. We'll talk about that. But how do we do? with the way we take care of things? And what are the consequences of being a good and wise steward? And that's really one of the keys of this mortal experience. We are stewards. We are stewards over many things. From the Come, Follow Me and the Institute Manual, we have a great quote from Elder Quentin L. Cook from the Quorum of the Twelve. This is from October 2009 General Conference, a talk called Stewardship, a Sacred Trust. He says, quote, Many believe we are not accountable to God 
and that we do not have personal responsibility or stewardship for ourselves or others. Now he goes on to say, In the church, stewardship is not limited to a temporal trust or responsibility. President Spencer W. Kimball taught, We are stewards over our bodies, our minds, families, and properties. A faithful steward is one who exercises righteous dominion, cares for his own, and looks to the poor and needy. With respect to our stewardships for our families, some have taught that when we report to the Savior and he asks us to give an account of our earthly responsibilities, two important inquiries will relate to our families. The first will be our relationship with our spouse, and the second will be about each of our children. In all our stewardship efforts, we follow Jesus Christ. We try to emulate what he asked us to do, both by his teachings and his example. My hope is that each of us will review individually and as families the stewardships for which we have responsibility and accountability. I pray that we will do so knowing we are ultimately accountable to God. End quote. Fantastic. This brings us then to Doctrine and Covenants, section 52, and let's take a look at the background leading up to that revelation from the Institute Manual. By the end of May 1831, nearly all of the New York Church members from Palmyra, Fayette, and Colesville areas had moved to Ohio in obedience to the Lord's commandment. On June 3rd through the 6th in 1831, a general conference of the church was held in a series of meetings in Kirtland, Ohio. This conference was likely a fulfillment of a February 1831 revelation in which the Lord declared that the elders of my church should be called together from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. If the elders proved faithful and exercised faith, the Lord promised to pour out his spirit upon them. Also during the conference, the prophet Joseph Smith ordained some of the elders to the office of high priest. These were the first ordinations to the office of high priest in the restored church. The prophet declared, It was clearly evident that the Lord gave us power in proportion to the work to be done, and strength according to the race set before us, and grace and help as our needs required. Although church members at the conference had joyful spiritual experiences, John Whitmer recorded that the adversary was also present. While the Lord poured out his spirit upon his servants, the devil took occasion to make known his power, and he bound Harvey Whitlock so that he could not speak. The Lord revealed the design of the adversary to the prophet, and Joseph commanded the devil in the name of Christ, and he departed to our joy and comfort. On the last day of the conference, June 6th, the prophet Joseph Smith received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 52. A few years later, he wrote in a church newspaper that this revelation had been received by an heavenly vision. Very nice. So let's jump into it. Verse 1. Behold, thus saith the Lord unto the elders whom he hath called and chosen in these last days by the voice of his Spirit, saying, I, the Lord, will make known unto you what ye shall do from this time until the next conference, which shall be held in Missouri, upon the land which I will consecrate unto my people, which are a remnant of Jacob, and those who are heirs according to the covenant. Wherefore, verily I say unto you, let my servants Joseph Smith, Jr., and Sidney Rigdon, Take their journey as soon as preparations can be made to leave their homes and journey to the land of Missouri. And inasmuch as they are faithful unto me, it shall be made known unto them what they shall do. And it shall also, inasmuch as they are faithful, be made known unto them the land of your inheritance. And inasmuch as they are not faithful, they shall be cut off, even as I will, as seemeth me good. Okay, so one of the things that has been a big concern among the members of the church is the location of Zion or the land of their inheritance. They knew that it wasn't Kirtland, but it hadn't yet been revealed where it was. Now, interestingly, they are sending Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon to Missouri, and that's also where we're going to hold the next conference, and there it will be made known unto them the specific land. Yeah, 
Very exciting. Well, and what an interesting principle there in verses 4 and 5. As we follow God's instructions faithfully, then he'll reveal more of his will to us. So that's interesting that he lets them know that more is to come. And we have that as a standing principle in the church in our article of faith, that we believe that God will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So it's our job to be faithful in what has been revealed, and he will reveal more. And it's interesting there in verse 4, And inasmuch as they are faithful unto me, it shall be made known unto them what they shall do. One of the things you want to take away from that is that it seems to imply that Joseph and Sidney didn't necessarily know what they were to do. Sure. And that there are things that we're given line upon line, you know, moving forward without necessarily knowing the whole picture. But the more that they are faithful unto the other instructions, the Lord will reveal more and more of what they are to do. I can tell you that that has been true in my life experience. Me too. Definitely. Very common. So in verses 7 and 8, Lyman Wright and John Coral are to journey to Missouri, and then John Murdoch and Hiram Smith are to journey to Missouri by way of Detroit in verse 8. It's about a 900-mile journey from Kirtland to Missouri by foot. It would take about two months. Now, you may recall we just talked about the New York Saints traveling to Kirtland. That was about a month. So if you look on the map... You look at the distance, that makes good sense. Yeah. And of course, the time is going to depend on what they use to travel with. Right. And how big a party they're traveling with, you know, how sure. fast that party can travel. It would be probably six to eight weeks. It yeah. It would be a long trip. But it, it gives you a good perspective on that. And isn't that painful? When we think of traveling from Ohio to Missouri today, we plan a day or two. Right. It would be a day or two if we're traveling by car, you know, if right, we're flying. Right, and relaxing. Maybe an hour. Sure. What a perspective. And it's interesting there, you'd mentioned in verse 7 and 8 that there are people that are also commanded to go down to Missouri, and they've distinguished John Murdoch and Hiram Smith to journey to Missouri by the way of Detroit. It's not really on the way. Well, we're going to find out why that is a little later in the section. Now, if you're curious about the distances, or you could see that on this map here, it shows that they traveled part of the way by river and so forth. If you want to know more about that, I would recommend that you check out the Joseph Smith Papers Project. And if you do, from the front page, click on Media, then Maps, and you'll see that they've got a whole bunch of maps here that carefully walk through where the travels happened and what routes were taken. And then they've got additional maps that can help you with your own study and edification. Lots of great things. Again, travels, missions, details, areas, wonderful resource. Check it out. We've talked about this on the show before, but boy, what a place you can just get lost in. Yeah. There's so much there that's just wonderful to look at and to study and really enhance your study of the Doctrine and Covenants. Highly recommended. I hope you're paying attention to some of these resources because one of the things we're really dedicated to this year, and I hope you've seen it throughout the episodes, trying to show you all the amazing resources the church has put out that can help us to gain an understanding of this. It's so much that if you tried to say them all at once, it would seem overwhelming. So I hope you check these out as we share them as you discover new resources. Let's take a look at verses 9 and 10. It says, And let them journey from thence, preaching the word by the way, saying none other things than that which the prophets and apostles have written, and that which is taught them by the Comforter through the prayer of faith. Let them go two by two, and thus let them preach by the way in every congregation, baptizing by water and the laying on of the hands by the water's side. Interesting. So this is more than just a commission to, I want you to move from Kirtland to Missouri. This is a mission. Yep. They are to preach along the way. They are to go in companionships, two by two. Now, skipping a couple of verses down, verse 12, And let my servant Lyman White beware, for Satan desireth to sift him as chaff. That's got to be a little unsettling. That is... <laughs> That's very specific. That's a little ominous, yes. And Thanks. I don't know the specifics of that circumstance, but boy, if I'm Lyman, I just, ye should be paying attention. Absolutely. But let's look further down then, verse 14. Now, as we take a look at these next 
verses look for actions and attributes that the Lord said would help his people avoid being deceived by Satan, which he warned Lyman White about, but is a warning for all of us. So see what you see there. Starting in verse 14, And again, I will give unto you a pattern in all things, that you may not be deceived. For Satan is abroad in the land, and he goeth forth deceiving the nations. Wherefore he that prayeth, whose spirit is contrite, the same is accepted of me, if he obey mine ordinances. Now, a person whose spirit is contrite might be described as a person who has a repentant attitude. Mm -hmm. And he says there that that person is accepted of me if they obey mine ordinances. Right. So he not only needs to pray and have a contrite spirit, but he needs to obey the ordinances. He needs to be someone who has gotten baptized, who has received the Holy Ghost, has received the priesthood, partakes of the sacrament, etc. Verse 16, he that speaks whose spirit is contrite, whose language is meek and edifieth, the same is of God, if he obey mine ordinances. So again, we've got the description of a person here whose language is meek and edifieth, and that's interesting, seems to describe a person whose speech is humble and who lifts or builds others. Yeah, that edifieth would be something constructive. It's yeah. meant to uplift, build. Yeah. But again, it's if he obey mine ordinances. That same if clause is there as in the previous verse. Verse 17, and again, he that trembleth under my power shall be made strong and shall bring forth fruits of praise and wisdom according to the revelations and truths which I have given you. So here again, he's describing somebody, that person who trembleth under my power might be a person who feels reverence for the power of God. That person will be made strong. And a person who brings forth fruits of praise and wisdom might be a person who produces something good by following the revelations God has given. In verse 18, and again, he that is overcome and bringeth not forth fruits, even according to this pattern, is not of me. Wherefore, by this pattern, ye shall know the spirits in all cases under the whole heavens. So again, as you look back over these verses, look for those actions and attributes that we've just talked about. Those the Lord said would help his people avoid being deceived. Now, it's interesting that you can use this certainly to evaluate leaders in your own life and people that you work with in the church. But I think it's most constructive to point it to ourselves. How are yeah. we doing in this? Are we accepted of God? Are we praying? Is our spirit contrite? Is our language meek and edifying? It's a very important thing to think about. Yeah, those are amazing attributes if you could imagine somebody who embodied those. And maybe you know somebody, and hopefully we embody some of those. Well, and I'm sure that we recognize that these come from the Savior. These are certainly his attributes. Absolutely. Now, going on in verses 22 through 32, we have a list of companionships that are to journey to Missouri. And this may seem odd because you'd think if they were all going to the same location, why wouldn't they travel together? Remember that we had a previous clarification in this section in which Hiram and his companion were to travel to Missouri by Detroit. Well, here we finally get an explanation as to why. Let's take a look at verse 33. Yea, verily I say, let all these take their journey unto one place in their several courses, and one man shall not build upon another's foundation, neither journey in another's track. He that is faithful, the same shall be kept and blessed with much fruit. Now, for anyone who has served a mission, these verses might seem a little interesting. For those of you who have not served a mission, it's common practice for proselyting missions to be divided into areas. And these areas are handled typically by one companionship. And that companionship is typically not to travel outside of their area, they're to work in that area. This is where that inspiration comes from. Yeah, we have this notion that they will each take their own course and do their labors along the way. And Hiram and his companion are evidently taking the long way, <laughs> yeah. but 
there are other companionships that are coming down to Missouri, but they need to take a different path and continue to preach along the way. And that's yeah. why they're divided into companionships and not just one big solid group. Now, lest we forget what this asks of the people involved. For example, the Institute Manual tells us that Bishop Partridge's wife, Lydia, left an account of the circumstances under which her husband, Edward, received this revelatory injunction. Their children had all contracted the measles from some of the recently arrived New York members who were staying with their family. She wrote that their eldest daughter was taken down with lung fever, and while she was at the worst, my husband was called by revelation to go with a number of others to Missouri to locate a place for the gathering of the saints. The unbelievers thought he must be crazy or he would not go. And I thought myself that I had reason to think my trials had commenced, and so they had. But this trial, like all others, was followed with blessings for our daughter recovered. Nice. Now, as a side note, we see in 37, not everybody was able to fulfill the calling given. Heman Bassett evidently transgressed, so his calling was given to Simon's rider. But let's look at what the task is for those who are not assigned specifically to go on this mission journey toward Missouri. In verse 39, let the residue of the elders watch over the churches and declare the word in regions round about them, and let them labor with their own hands, that there be no idolatry nor wickedness practiced. And remember in all things the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted. For he that doeth not these things, the same is not my disciple." From the Institute Manual, there's an added emphasis on that phrase to remember the poor and the needy from President Gordon B. Hinckley. This comes from the teachings of Gordon B. Hinckley. He says, quote, In remembering together before the Lord the poor, the needy, and the oppressed, there is developed unconsciously but realistically a love for others above self, a respect for others, a desire to serve the needs of others, one cannot ask God to help a neighbor in distress without feeling motivated to do something oneself towards helping that neighbor. I heard a man of prominence say the other day, I have amended the language of my prayers. Instead of saying, bless the poor and the sick and the needy, I now say, Father, show me how to help the poor and the sick and the needy and give me resolution to do so. End quote. That's beautiful. That's a powerful perspective. Yeah, and I love the use of agency there. Let's take a look in verse 42. It says, And thus, even as I have said, if ye are faithful, ye shall assemble yourselves together to rejoice upon the land of Missouri, which is the land of your inheritance, which is now the land of your enemies. But behold, I, the Lord, will hasten the city in its time and will crown the faithful with joy and rejoicing. So we still don't know specifically where the land of their inheritance is, but now it's very clear it's in Missouri. Yeah. We got that much information. That's great. Well, let's take us then to section 53. Welcome to 53. And we get introduced to a new character. Who is Algernon Sidney Gilbert? By the way, I think we need to have more people named Algernon. I feel like I'm that too. Hang on to that. Yeah. Yep. So remember that, my sons. You may have dodged a bullet. <laughs> but from Joseph Smith's revelations, we're told Sidney Gilbert, the recipient of this revelation, was Newell K. Whitney's business partner and an early convert to the church. He may have been present at a June 5th. 1831 meeting at which Joseph Smith taught that the elders would have large congregations to speak to and they must soon take their departure into the regions west. The next evening, Joseph Smith dictated a revelation that commissioned a number of elders to accompany him to Missouri, which the text called, The land which I will consecrate unto my people, which are a remnant of Jacob, and those who are heirs according to the covenant. The 6th of June revelation did not name Gilbert among those who should travel to Missouri. Joseph Smith's history records that shortly after the reception of that revelation, Gilbert approached Joseph Smith and requested direction for himself. In response, Joseph Smith 
dictated this revelation that gave Gilbert assignments in the church, including the instruction to travel to Missouri with Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon. Gilbert left for Missouri on the 18th of June with Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon. Interesting. Now, I know how difficult it is to keep track of different characters, but if you'll remember, Newell K. Whitney and Sidney Gilbert then ran the store in Kirtland. And if you'll remember, Joseph Smith came into the store when he arrived in Kirtland and said, Newell K. Whitney, thou art the man. That story was to Newell K. Whitney. Sidney Gilbert was his business partner. He was the one that helped him with the store. Great perspective. All right, let's start with verse 1. Behold, I say unto you, my servant Sidney Gilbert, that I have heard your prayers, and you have called upon me that it should be made known unto you of the Lord your God concerning your calling and election in the church, which I the Lord have raised up in these last days. Behold, I the Lord, who is crucified for the sins of the world, give unto you a commandment that you shall forsake the world. Take upon you mine ordination, even that of an elder, to preach faith and repentance and remission of sins according to my word and the reception of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. Now, the Institute Manual has a quote from Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is from the April 1989 General Conference. He says, In the church, we often state the couplet, be in the world, but not of the world. Perhaps we should state the couplet as two separate admonitions. First, be in the world, be involved, be informed, try to be understanding and tolerant and to appreciate diversity, make meaningful contributions to society through service and involvement. Second, be not of the world. Do not follow wrong paths or bend to accommodate or accept what is not right. In spite of all the wickedness in the world, and in spite of all the opposition to good that we find on every hand, we should not try to take ourselves or our children out of the world. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven or yeast. We are to lift the world and help all to rise above the wickedness that surrounds us. Very powerful. In verse 5, we're told, And again, verily I say unto you, you shall take your journey with my servants, Joseph Smith Jr. and Sidney Rigdon. So there was his call. He's going yeah. to go to Missouri, and he's going to accompany Joseph and Sidney. Now, in verse 6, we have a reference again to ordinances. He says, Behold, these are the first ordinances which you shall receive, and the residue shall be made known in a time to come, according to your labor in my vineyard. The word ordinance sometimes refers to a rule or a decree. So in other words, as we follow God's instructions faithfully, he reveals more of his will to us. So wonderful direction, and that's something that we can certainly imply to all of us. Substitute in our own name. For whoever you are, you shall forsake the world. Wonderful. Awesome. Let's go on to section 54. From Joseph Smith's Revelations, we learn, In May 1831, shortly after they arrived in Ohio, in compliance with Revelations directing all New York members to gather there, Joseph Smith instructed Bishop Edward Partridge to settle the Colesville members in Thompson on land offered by convert Lehman Copley, a former Shaker. When Joseph Smith moved to Ohio in early February, Copley had invited Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon to live with him at Thompson, offering to furnish them houses and provisions and so forth. While both Joseph Smith and Rigdon made other living arrangements for their families, Joseph Knight Sr., who accompanied Joseph Smith to Ohio, recalled that in March he and Joseph Smith went to Thompson, presumably to see about settling the soon-to-be emigrating Colesville congregation on Copley's property. Once the Colesville members arrived in Ohio, Joseph Smith sent them to Thompson to live on Copley's extensive land holdings. The arrangement with Copley apparently granted the Colesville members the privilege to live on the property in return for making improvements upon it. And according to Joseph Knight Sr., they all went to work and made fence and planted and sowed the fields. On May 7th, 
Copley was called to preach, along with Sidney Rigdon and Parley B. Pratt, to the Shaker settlement in nearby North Union, Ohio. You remember that from our discussion of Section 49? Right. However, the missionary expedition failed to convert any of the Shakers, and the resulting confrontation between the Latter-day Saint elders and the Shakers apparently disturbed Copley. He soon went back to North Union, where he apparently reconciled with the Shaker community, and he then returned to Thompson with Shaker leader Ashbel Kitchell, perhaps intending to evict the saints. During his visit to Thompson, Kitchell held a meeting with the saints on Copley's farm, was involved in a contentious altercation, and initiated efforts to remove them. Joseph Knight Jr. recalled, We had to leave his, Copley's, farm and pay $60 damage, adding bitterly that the payment was for fitting up his houses and planting his ground. Because of the difficulties with Copley, Newell Knight, the presiding elder over the Colesville group, went to Kirtland to consult with Joseph Smith before the conference held in early June. Knight later explained that as a result of a revelation on June 6th, that was section 52, we just studied that, the last day of the conference, we now understood that this, Ohio, was not the land of our inheritance, the land of promise, for it was made known in a revelation that Missouri was the place chosen for the gathering of the church, and several were called to lead the way to that state. Though that 6th of June revelation addressed the church generally, the 10th of June revelation responded specifically to the concerns of the Colesville members living in Thompson. Knight later introduced the revelation in these words, As I had come to see Brother Joseph concerning our position in Thompson, he inquired of the Lord and received the following revelation. John Whitmer similarly recalled, At this time, the church at Thompson, Ohio, was involved in difficulty because of the rebellion of Lehman Copley, who would not do as he had previously agreed, which thing confused the whole church. And finally, the Lord spake unto Joseph Smith, Jr., the prophet. So let's take a look at this. Let's start in verse 2 and look for what the saints needed to do to help improve their situation. Verse 2, Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, my servant Newell Knight, you shall stand fast in the office whereunto I have appointed you. And if your brethren desire to escape their enemies, let them repent of all their sins and become truly humble before me and contrite. Isn't that interesting? There are times when the Lord will deliver us from our enemies by parting the Red Sea or calling down storms from heaven or something. In this case, and this is maybe more common, if we want to escape our enemies, more often than not, this is the counsel we will be given. Let us repent of our sins and become truly humble before me and contrite. Look at ourselves. How yeah. can we fix ourselves? Isn't that interesting? So often we want everyone else to change. But in the scriptures, more often than not, the Lord wants us to change. So which office was Newell appointed, as it mentions in verse 1? Well, there's two, actually. One, he was the leader of the Colesville Saints. Two, he and Selah J. Griffin were called four days ago from this revelation to go to Missouri. Yeah, he was among those listed in Doctrine and Covenants section 52, verse 32, specifically was he and Selah. Right. So the take-home message here seems to be stick to our duties, the things the Lord has called you to do, and be humble and contrite, and repent of your sins, and the Lord will take care of the injustices. Going on in verse 4, look for words and phrases the Lord uses to describe what happens when a covenant is broken. In verse 4, And as the covenant which they made unto me has been broken, even so it has become void and of none effect. And woe unto him by whom this offense cometh. For it had been better for him that he had been drowned in the depths of the sea. But blessed are they who have kept the covenant and observed the commandment, for they shall obtain mercy. So who's the they we're referring to here? Well, this is Lehman at the yeah, very least. Right. Could be more, but Lehman had made a covenant to use his land and he broke it. 
Well, Lehman, probably not the best choice. There are consequences. From the Institute Manual, there's a note from Jeffrey R. Holland. This is from a New Era article in January 2012 called Keeping Covenants, a Message for Those Who Will Serve a Mission. He says, quote, Only covenant makers and covenant keepers can claim the ultimate blessings of the celestial kingdom. Yes, when we talk about covenant keeping, we are talking about the heart and soul of our purpose in mortality. A covenant is a binding spiritual contract, a solemn promise to God, our Father, that we will live and think and act in a certain way, the way of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In return, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost promise us the full splendor of eternal life. If we really want to succeed in our callings, if we want to have access to every help and every advantage and every blessing from the Father, if we want to have the door of heaven thrown open to us that we might receive the powers of godliness, we must keep our covenants, end quote. Wonderful counsel, Elder Holland. Yes. So going on, verses 7 and 8 what are the Colesville saints to do as they've just been kicked off Lehman Copley's land? Well, they are to follow Newell Knight to Missouri. So going on in verse 9, And after you have done journeying, behold, I say unto you, Seek ye a living, like unto men, until I prepare a place for you. And again, be patient in tribulation until I come. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. And they who have sought me early shall find rest to their souls. Even so, amen. I love that. So what do we do when we get there? Get a job? Get a job. Work hard. Be patient. And the Lord's reward is with him. That's the place we want to be, is with him. Now, Newell and about 60 other Colesville saints with him arrived at Independence, Missouri at the end of July, less than two months, which is pretty good travel. That's about 15 miles a day. That's quite impressive. Yeah. Especially with a group that size. Right. Well, let's take us then to section 55, and we get a new introduction. Who was William W. Phelps? Now, we've talked about William W. Phelps a couple of times early on in lessons, just briefly. But let's talk about him a little bit more deeply. This comes from Joseph Smith's Revelations. This revelation was directed to William W. Phelps. In 1830, Phelps was the publisher of an anti-Masonic newspaper, the Ontario Phoenix, in Canandaigua, New York, about 14 miles from Palmyra. On the 9th of April, two weeks after the Book of Mormon was offered for sale, Phelps purchased a copy. He later wrote, Notwithstanding my body was not baptized into this church till June 1831, Yet my heart was there from the time I became acquainted with the Book of Mormon. Oh, that's cool. In December 1830, he traveled to Fayette, New York, to meet Joseph Smith and came away from the experience further committed to the new movement and convinced that he needed to quit the folly of my way and the fancy and fame of this world and seek the Lord and his righteousness. In late April 1831, shortly after the majority of church members left New York for Ohio, Phelps was arrested and imprisoned for 30 days in Lyons, New York, apparently over a delinquent debt he owed in Canandaigua. While incarcerated, Phelps relinquished the editorship of the Phoenix, and immediately after his release, he journeyed with his family to Ohio to join the Saints. He reached Buffalo, New York on the 12th of June, 1831, and was in Kirtland, Ohio by the 14th of June. His arrival prompted this revelation, which directed that he be ordained an elder and that he assist Oliver Cowdery in doing the work of printing. Phelps was soon ordained an elder and later served as a printer for the Evening and the Morning Star. We've talked about this before on the show. The Evening and the Morning Star was the first publication that the church had, the first magazine, if you want to call it that. Yeah, all right, let's take a look at this revelation then, starting in verse 1. Behold, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant William, yea, even the Lord of the whole earth, thou art called and chosen. And after thou hast been baptized by water, 
which, if you do with an eye single to my glory, you shall have a remission of your sins and a reception of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. Now, that's interesting already in verse 1. Notice that he's called and chosen, but he hasn't even been baptized yet. That is interesting. Going on to verse 2. And then thou shalt be ordained by the hand of my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., to be an elder unto this church, to preach repentance and remission of sins by way of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And on whomsoever you shall lay your hands, if they are contrite before me, you shall have power to give the Holy Spirit. So going on in verse 4, it says, And again you shall be ordained to assist my servant Oliver Cowdery to do the work of printing and of selecting and writing books for schools in this church, that little children also may receive instruction before me, as is pleasing unto me. Now, this is really interesting to me. One of the things that is fascinating about W.W. Phelps is his background in printing. And the Lord used that to great effect. From the Institute Manual, we're told, William was involved in many efforts to write for the church and publish and print its written works, In Missouri, he printed the Book of Commandments and the first church newspaper, The Evening and the Morning Star. He later helped prepare and print the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants and the first hymn book of the church. He also wrote the lyrics to many Latter-day Saint hymns, including The Spirit of God, Praise to the Man, and Redeemer of Israel. It's amazing to see the Lord work with people. And William W. Phelps was clearly prepared. If you'll recall, we mentioned that the Book of Commandments was not completed when it was printed because a mob had destroyed the press. That was William W. Phelps's press. Right. The last two verses, he's to travel with Joseph and Sidney to Missouri and snuck in at the end, Joseph Coe is also to go with him. And I don't know Joseph Coe very well, but he's added to Joseph and Sidney in their party to go to Missouri. Well, I'm glad he's there. Yep. So let's move on to section 56. And let's take our introduction for that section from the Joseph Smith Revelations. When he copied the following revelation into Revelation Book 1, John Whitmer introduced it by writing, Thomas B. Marsh was desirous to know what he should do as the Lord had commanded him and Ezra Thayer to take their journey to the land of Missouri. But Thayer could not get ready as soon as Thomas wanted that he should. Thayer and Marsh had been commanded in a 6th of June 1831 revelation to take their journey also, preaching the word by the way unto this same land, Missouri, And nine days later, Marsh was apparently ready to depart with others traveling to Missouri while Thayer was not. An earlier revelation directed Thayer to board with Joseph Smith Sr. on Frederick G. Williams' farm. That same revelation directed that all the brethren immediately assembled together and put up an house for my servant Ezra on Williams' property. It also instructed Thayer to humble himself and at the conference meeting he shall be ordained unto power from on high, and he shall go from thence if he be obedient to my commandments, and proclaim my gospel unto the western regions with my servants that must go forth even unto the borders of the Lamanites. It is uncertain what prevented Thayer from accompanying Marsh, but this revelation refers to the former commandment which I have given him, Thayer, concerning the place upon which he lives, and the money Thayer had apparently paid for it. It is likely that he paid some of the balance Williams owed Isaac Moore on the farm where he and the Joseph Smith Sr. family lived and worked. Because the revelation asserts that there shall no divisions be made upon the land, Thayer may have previously requested that before his departure for Missouri, a title be assigned to him for the portion of land he had paid for. The revelation also suggests that he might have requested that the money he had paid toward the debt be returned to him if he was not assigned title. The 6th of June, 1831 revelation had also directed that Newell Knight, leader of the Colesville branch, then located at Thompson, Ohio, 
and Sela Griffin traveled together to Missouri. Both men received further instruction in this 15th of June revelation. Recent difficulties between the Colesville, New York believers and landowner Lehman Copley, we've been talking about that, who withdrew his offer to allow them to settle on his property, prompted a 10th of June revelation that directed the Colesville group to move to Missouri. That revelation further instructed the Thompson members to appoint whom you will to be your leader and to pay monies for you. Upon learning that revelations had both dictated their removal to Missouri and assigned their leader, Newell Knight, to leave them for a preaching mission, some of the members in Thompson may have voiced concerns to Joseph Smith. Whatever the impetus, this revelation rescinded the command for Knight to leave on a mission and instead assigned Knight's previously named missionary companion, Selah Griffin, to accompany Marsh in place of Thayer. Starting in verse 1, let's look at what did the Lord say about those who refused to obey his commandments. Verse 1, Hearken, O ye people who profess my name, saith the Lord your God. For behold, mine anger is kindled against the rebellious, and they shall know mine arm and mine indignation in the day of visitation and of wrath upon the nations. And he that will not take up his cross and follow me and keep my commandments, the same shall not be saved. Going on in verse 3, Behold, I the Lord command, and he that will not obey shall be cut off in mine own due time, after I have commanded, and the commandment is broken. Wherefore, I the Lord command and revoke, as seemeth me good, and all this to be answered upon the heads of the rebellious, saith the Lord. So this is an important principle. The Lord can give a commandment or revoke a commandment as he sees fit. Can we think of times when that's happened in scriptural history? The ones that come easily to mind are things like the Lord offering the higher law to Moses and his people. The children of Israel rebelled and began worshiping a golden calf. And then the Lord revoked that law and gave them a lesser law. During the Savior's mortal ministry, he sent the apostles only to the members of the house of Israel. And then shortly after the Savior's resurrection, he told the apostles to preach the gospel to all nations. In the Latter-day Dispensation, we had the Lord commanding some early members of the church to practice plural marriage. The prophet Joseph Smith and many other church leaders found this commandment difficult, but they obeyed it. After receiving revelation, President Wilfred Woodruff issued the manifesto, which led to the ending of that command to follow plural marriage. I think as we look time and time again, the Lord will give command, he'll revoke command as his children are ready and as they need to be given more or less or to help them to grow. I mean, as he sees fit, that's the best way to say it. That's the key. That reminds me of the statement made by Joseph Smith where he says, quote, I made this my rule. When the Lord commands, do it. Amen. Going on in verse 5, Wherefore I revoke the commandment, which was given unto my servants Thomas B. Marsh and Ezra Thayer, and give a new commandment unto my servant Thomas, that he shall take up his journey speedily to the land of Missouri, and my servant Selah J. Griffin shall also go with him. For behold, I revoke the commandment which was given unto my servants Selah J. Griffin and Newell Knight, in consequence of the stiff-neckedness of my people, which are in Thompson, and their rebellions. Wherefore, let my servant Newell Knight remain with them, and as many as will go, may go, that are contrite before me, and be led by him to the land which I have appointed. And again I say unto you that my servant Ezra Thayer must repent of his pride and of his selfishness, and obey the former commandment which I have given him concerning the place upon which he lives. And if he will do this, as there shall be no divisions made upon the land, he shall be appointed still to go to the land of Missouri. Otherwise, he shall receive the money which he has paid, and shall leave the place, and shall be cut off out of my church, saith the Lord God of hosts. So Ezra's call is revoked. Newell Knight and Selah J. Griffin's companionship is broken. Selah is now companions with Thomas B. Marsh, and Newell once again leads the Colesville Saints. All right. Well, that brings us to verse 14b. 
Behold, thus saith the Lord unto my people, You have many things to do and to repent of. For behold, your sins have come up unto me and are not pardoned, because you seek to counsel in your own ways, and your hearts are not satisfied, and ye obey not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Woe unto you rich men that will not give your substance to the poor, for your riches will canker your souls. And this shall be your lamentation in the day of visitation, and of judgment, and of indignation. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and my soul is not saved. Woe unto you poor men, whose hearts are not broken, whose spirits are not contrite, and whose bellies are not satisfied, and whose hands are not stayed from laying hold upon other men's goods whose eyes are full of greediness, and who will not labor with your own hands. Wow. So the rich men are condemned, the poor men are condemned. To quote the apostles of old, who then can be saved? It's interesting that in 16, it's not woe unto the rich, period, that will not give of your substance to the poor. It's woe unto the poor whose hearts are not broken. Look at the similarities between the unrepented hearts of both the rich and the poor. Sometimes we like to talk about whether past or present. People like to condemn the rich because of their riches or the poor because of their poverty. And yet it's about hearts, not about where your financials are. Where is your heart? And both rich and poor can have unrepented hearts and be guilty of sin before God. I found a really interesting quote in the Old Institute Manual for the Doctrine and Covenants. This is the 2001 Student Institute Manual. I'm going to hold off telling you where this is from because it's surprisingly modern. It is from a prophet of God, though. It says, quote, That is the situation of many of our own brothers and sisters in America with all the blessings that we enjoy better wages, better homes, better opportunities for education than have ever been known before. Yet we have today men who not only will not work themselves, but they also will not permit somebody else to be employed. They are not willing to earn their living by work, but they propose to take it from the rich man. We must not fall into the bad habits of other people. We must not get into the frame of mind that we will take what the other man has— Refer back to the Ten Commandments, and you will find one short paragraph. Thou shalt not covet. That is what is the matter with a good many people today. They are coveting what somebody else has, when as a matter of fact, many of them have been cared for and provided with means to live by those very ones from whom they would take away property. End quote. This is not from President Nelson. This is not from President Monson, President Hinckley. This is from President George Albert Smith in October 1949 General Conference. Some things really don't change very much. True enough. So who is to be saved? Verse 18. But blessed are the poor who are pure in heart, whose hearts are broken and whose spirits are contrite, for they shall see the kingdom of God coming in power and great glory unto their deliverance, for the fatness of the earth shall be theirs. Notice this is a promise to both the rich and the poor. Right. The financials are not what's important here. The heart is. For behold, the Lord shall come, and his recompense shall be with him, and he shall reward every man, and the poor shall rejoice. Now here he's referring to the poor in heart. Yeah. There's a quote from Elder Joseph B. Worthland back in the October 2008 General Conference in which he says, The Lord compensates the faithful for every loss. That which is taken away from those who love the Lord will be added unto them in his own way. While it may not come at the time we desire, the faithful will know that every tear today will eventually be returned an hundredfold with tears of rejoicing and gratitude. Now that's from one of his later talks, Come What May and Love It. 
And yeah. that would actually be a really good talk to read. That's a great talk. It is. It's a great talk. But let's go on. Section 57. Last one today. This one has a lot of background, but it's really, really interesting. So bear with us. This comes from Revelations in Context. For generations, a small number of Europeans, mainly Spanish and French traders, lived among the Indians along the Missouri River, intermarried, and entered into commerce with them. But as white families pushed westward, settling in lands then occupied by Indians, they overwhelmingly rejected these cultural exchanges. Whites demanded that all Indian tribes be removed from the state. Between 1824 and 1830, tribes who had lived within Missouri's borders for centuries ceded virtually all their territory. The mighty Osage sold their lands in 1825 and migrated further west to Kansas and Oklahoma. By the time the Latter-day Saints arrived in Jackson County in 1831, Indians had vacated their settlements and evacuated beyond a newly established line dividing Indian and white territories. Doctrine and Covenants 57 observed the existence of this settlement line without endorsing it. The revelation noted that Zion should be built along the line running directly between Jew and Gentile, or the line separating the state of Missouri from Indian Territory to the west. The revelation resisted the usual categories, however, primarily through its curious use of the terms Jew and Gentile. The standard terms then used by Americans, white and Indian, or white and red, suggested a racial and cultural divide. The two groups were worlds apart, and white people often deployed the terminology to emphasize this incompatibility. The categories of Jew and Gentile, however, indicated a distinction between groups, but not an incompatibility between them. According to the Book of Mormon, both Jew and Gentile had a vital role in God's unfolding plan. God invited them to work together. The gospel in ancient times would go from the Jews, God's ancient covenant people, unto the Gentiles, who would be grafted into the covenant. In the latter days, the relationship would be reversed. The gospel would proceed from the Gentiles unto the Jews, who would come to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Doctrine and Covenants 57 echoes this covenantal structure by designating Indians as Jews. In this way, recognizing the group as part of God's covenant people, the Indians were of the house of Israel, chosen, beloved, and remembered by God. At the time when Indian removal, the separation of one race from another, had become a national policy of the U.S. government, Joseph Smith's revelations moved in another direction. Rather than marginalizing Indians, pushing them to the outskirts of civilization, the revelations brought Zion to them, putting God's holy city in their midst. Zion was to be found between Jew and Gentile, between the races. In this arrangement, people of multiple races could play an essential role in God's work. People on every compass point of the center, if they were willing, could become the pure in heart and dwell in Zion in safety and peace. That's such a great perspective to think about where Zion is placed and what that means for the Lord's invitation. The Institute Manual has a paragraph that I think could be helpful here. It says, after traveling approximately 900 miles, the prophet and his companions arrived first in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri, on July 14, 1831. There they were met by Oliver Cowdery, Peter Whitmer Jr., and Ziba Peterson, who had been called in the fall of 1830 as missionaries to preach the gospel to the Lamanites. These missionaries were accompanied by a recent convert to the church, Frederick G. Williams, who asked Oliver Cowdery if he could join them in their travels. Yeah, you might remember Oliver Cowdery and company had been called on the mission to the Lamanites, and they had been there for this whole time, but they had returned to meet the prophet in independence. So they have joined up again. Let's go on with some more insights, this time from the Joseph Smith's Revelations. According to a history Joseph Smith initiated in 1838, Joseph Smith spent time upon his arrival in Independence ruminating on the situation of the American Indians living in the wilderness across the border. Perhaps because an earlier revelation explained that the city of Zion was to be built among the Lamanites, 
these meditations prompted him to ask questions about when and where the city would be built. When will the wilderness blossom as the rose? When will Zion be built up in her glory? And where will thy temple stand, unto which all nations shall come in the last days? In another account, Joseph Smith remembered viewing the country before seeking diligently at the hand of God. According to that account, God manifested himself unto me and designated to me and others the very spot upon which he designed to commence the work of the gathering and the upbuilding of an holy city, which should be called Zion. The revelation designated Missouri as the land of Zion, established independence as the place at which to build the city of Zion, and designated the spot on which to build the temple. It also provided instruction to Partridge, who was appointed a bishop in February of 1831, and Sidney Gilbert, who was designated in June 1831 as an agent to the church, on purchasing lands and distributing them to church members so that the members could gather in Missouri. It further assigned Gilbert to open a store and Phelps to establish a printing operation. Isn't it interesting that the Lord is using people's talents that they had previously? Remember that Sidney Gilbert was Newell Whitney's business partner for their store in Kirtland. So, Sidney, I want you to open up a store. William W. Phelps, you ran the newspaper before. I want you to run a paper. Yeah. So let's take a look at the section. Starting in verse 1, Hearken, O ye elders of my church, saith the Lord your God who have assembled yourselves together according to my commandments in this land, which is the land of Missouri, which is the land which I have appointed and consecrated for the gathering of the saints. Wherefore, this is the land of promise and the place for the city of Zion. And thus saith the Lord your God, if you will receive wisdom, here is wisdom. Behold, the place which is now called independence is the center place. And a spot for the temple is lying westward upon a lot which is not far from the courthouse. That's exciting. So there's the reveal. Yep. The church has been established for just over a year. And we have a revelation giving the exact spot of not only the city of Zion, but the location of the temple. Right. From the Institute Manual, we're told the site for the city of Zion was located just below a bend in the Missouri River, about 10 miles east of the Missouri-Indian Territory Line, currently the Missouri-Kansas border. The land that makes up Missouri and several surrounding states had become part of the United States after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. After the purchase, new settlers, mostly from other southern states, moved into Missouri to settle the land. Missouri became a state in 1821, and in 1826, the state legislature created Jackson County. The newly settled town of Independence, which was located along a trade road called the Santa Fe Trail, became the county seat. At the time of this revelation, Jackson County had only a few hundred residents and a few public buildings, including the county courthouse. It's amazing sometimes, especially when we study church history, how quickly the Lord arranges things, how quickly the pieces come together. Notice that Missouri became a state in 1821. Jackson becomes a county in 1826. Here we are in 1831 with independence, with a couple of hundred people in it. But that's the spot. Well, and it's exciting that they wouldn't know That wouldn't have been revealed had they not done all the other things that they've done. That's right. And notice that the Lord did not tell them where until they got there. Right. That's very interesting. Going on the next few verses, they're given instructions to buy land. Sidney Gilbert is to buy land as an agent on behalf of the church. Edward Partridge is to portion the church's land among the members for their inheritances there in verse 7. And in verse 8, Sidney Gilbert is also to obtain a license to open a store and sell goods, as we talked about. That's right. Now, instructions here in verses 11 and 12 are given to W.W. Phelps. In verse 11, And again, verily I say unto you, let my servant William W. Phelps be planted in this place and be established as a printer under the church. And lo, if the world receive his writings, behold, here is wisdom. 
let him obtain whatsoever he can obtain in righteousness for the good of the saints. Wow, it's a powerful commission. In verse 13, we're talking to Oliver Cowdery. And let my servant Oliver Cowdery assist him, even as I have commanded, in whatsoever place I shall appoint unto him, to copy and to correct and select, that all things may be right before me, as it shall be proved by the Spirit through him. Now we've got the final instructions for the gathering in these last two verses, going on in 15. And now, concerning the gathering, let the bishop and the agent make preparations for those families which have been commanded to come to this land as soon as possible, and plant them in their inheritance. And unto the residue of both elders and members, further directions shall be given hereafter. Even so, amen. Now, as we wrap up our reading, and especially the journey that we've taken into the land of Missouri and to the establishment or the beginning of the establishment of Zion, consider examples of people that you know who build the church by using their personal strengths, their spiritual gifts or skills they possess. Each of us has an important role to play in building the Lord's kingdom, and don't you doubt it. Each one of us has special gifts, abilities, opportunities, privileges, whatever it is that can help to bless the kingdom of God on earth. And I think you'll find that the Lord helps us to discover skills and abilities that we didn't realize we had. Right. And also, I have found that the Lord helps us to be able to use skills and abilities that we know we have in ways that we had not considered. Mm -hmm. That's very common. So be open to that. Be open to those opportunities to serve. Be open to what it means to serve in the kingdom as we strive to establish Zion, one people. Well, what a journey we've had, even in this lesson. Yeah. And the church is barely a year old. Right. There is so much more. Mm -hmm. Remember that we don't have the Book of Commandments yet. We don't have the Doctrine and Covenants. We don't have the 12 Apostles. There's so many more things that need to be talked about. It's yeah. exciting as we go on further in this year, and we'll be looking forward to going over more of these revelations in our next lesson. And we'll look forward to seeing you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>